I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, Alison, maybe just take me through the day in court and uh, seven people charged in relation to the attempted murder of John Caldwell. Uh, that follows on from about, mm. about, what, 20 arrests in total in the case? Yeah, although some of those arrests took place the morning after the shooting. So, so DCI Caldwell was shot in February the 22nd as he was packing up after a coaching session. He coached for a youth football team, of which his son was a member. So he witnessed the attack. At that time, I would say John Caldwell was probably one of the most sort of high profile PSNI detectives in Northern Ireland. If you remember, just like fresh out of the, the Natalie McNally murder case, where a young woman and her unborn baby were murdered in their own home. And um, there was a, another murder in Lurgan of a guy called Shane Whitler, who was a, a member of what they call the firm, um, an organized crime gang there. And so it'd been on the news and on TV quite a lot. So, you know, when news started trickling through that he had been attacked. Um, at that stage, you know, people assume maybe it was a high profile. What was it had it attracted the the distant Republicans towards him? But as the story unfolded, um, we can see that there's obviously a very large group of suspects in this case. And yesterday they were arrested over the weekend and questioned, and then some were released, but seven have now been charged. And some of those names are very well known to people such as myself. Mm. But interestingly, they come from both sides of the community, despite the fact that this was very much an attack carried out by the group we call the new IRA. They call themselves the IRA. They're the people who would be responsible for the attacks on several prison officers, the murder of several prison officers since they were formed back in 2012, but also um, the, the killing of Larry McKay at a, at a riot in, in Craigan in 2019. Um, they have periods where they're really active and periods where they're inactive, mainly because they were infiltrated by MI5 and by Dennis McFadden and that took what we alleged or it was alleged by the prosecution was their leadership off the streets. So the attack on DC Caldwell came somewhat out of the blue, I would say. You know, two gunmen approached him. Um, they fired a number of shots, up to 10 shots. He was hit several times but managed to, to run away despite being seriously injured and was an intensive car, car for quite a long time. You know, we were told it sort of touch and go at one stage. But last week, he actually made an appearance at a, a trip by King Charles to, to Hillsborough. And mm. he was seen there meeting with the king and looked in, in pretty good health for a man who had been through the, the kind of ordeal he had been through. For sure. I was I thought he looked uh, incredible considering uh, the recovery he's had. And he hasn't really had that much time, you know, um, it's only a couple of months, really. But take us through the charges that were brought and there was quite a little bit of evidence given for what is a first appearance. You don't usually hear the kind of uh, detail that was given to the court on Monday. Yeah, and that's because a number of these people applied for bail. So once they applied for bail, we got a lot more detail than we would usually get. So it was a lengthy enough here and it was well over an hour ahead and up to an hour and a half because they split it up into several parts. By the way, that system works now where people appear by video link from Musgrave. They have to split them into groups of, of um groups of defendants. So first up was was 72-year-old James Ivor McLean, who is known as Ivor, um, and he's from Oma, along with his two sons, Matthew McLean and Robert McLean. Um, again, also both of those have had addresses in Oma, and they appeared alongside a guy called Alan McFarland, who is also from Deverney Park in Oma, and the court was told was actually in a relationship with one of Ivor McLean's daughters. Um, so they appeared first. There was some details as the, the police officer connected them to the crime. And um, what happens on a first appearance is a senior officer will get in, the prosecution will say, can you connect these people to this offence? They say, yes, we can. The, uh, to this offence, the defence are then allowed to question um, the, the connection if they want. Most times that doesn't take very long. But in this case, the other three were remanded into custody. But Ivor McLean, who is 72 years old, had applied for bail. So that was when we got a lot more detail than we were expecting to get in, in terms of this case. And what did you hear in relation to him or the evidence that there possibly is against him? So despite the fact that this is a, a new IRA distant Republican um, attack, it's significant in that Ivor McLean and his sons, Matthew and Robert, who would be, I suppose it would be fair to say, are very well known to the police in, in, that, in that area. Are from the, the Protestant faith. It was said in court, even though we had already known this, 
that Ivor McLean had a conviction dating back to 1981 for firearms. And at that stage, he was on the, the loyalist wing of the maze prison. I believe he served his time with the UVF prisoners on the maze. So you might think that this is this is an unlikely gathering of, of people. But what we have heard is that the, the allegation is the new IRA have claimed this attack. They have admitted they were responsible for it. And just as soon as last night, they again admitted that they were responsible for this attack. What the prosecution is alleging, and I'd just be clear, because probably some of the people listening to your podcast will go, why are they able to say so much about a live court case? This is this is a, a non-jury court case. Mm-hmm. All terrorist offences are put in front of, just like the, you would have the special criminal court, we have those sort of hang over those diplock tra- non-jury trials. So um, there's no jury to prejudice in this case. But um, the allegation is that this was a joint enterprise and the joint enterprise came about because DCI Caldwell had been responsible in the past for investigating all of these people. He had investigated them for criminal offences, for terrorist-related offences, for drugs offences, for robbery offences. And DCI Neil McGuinness, who was the investigating officer in this case, said that that connection between the defendants and the victim in this case ran almost, he said, like a golden thread throughout the entire case. So you could point to the connections between each and every one of them and DCI Caldwell, Mm. who they knew. He also said that Matthew McLean and Gavin Coyle, who I'll come to in a minute, um, know each other very well and that there's a history of that and a history of that connection between the two of them. So what they were alleging is that Alan McFarland, who, as I've said, was in a relationship with one of those, in a relationship with one of, McLean, um, one of the McLeans, he is said to have been present at Ballyclare Auction House when one of the Ford Fiestas used by the gunmen was purchased um, they call the, the there's two blue fiestas used in this case. They call them Fiesta One, Fiesta Two in court. Um, and then it is alleged that Matthew McLean bought number plates at a, a sort of car dealership place. He bought fake number plates, um, which were to be put onto these Ford Fiestas. Um, and the two cars, so the one that was bought in Ballyclare, another car that was bought in a different location and it had been stored in North Belfast. He bought fake number plates. The number plates actually, so I'm, getting, I'm going to be a bit of, of a tangent here. This is just something I know because I've done stories in the past about ringer cars. Basically, the number plates were from Ford Fiestas, from blue Ford Fiestas, the fake number plates, just not these Fiestas. Right. So he had obviously, um, you know, whether they drive around car parks looking for similar Ford Fiestas and write down the number plate, but they said one of them belonged to a, Ford, a blue Ford Fiesta that was like from, that was from 2000, but it was just a fake number plate from a Ford Fiesta attached on to these Ford Fiestas and both of them were fitted with these fake plates. One was stored in North Belfast, um, as we've said, and they are saying that Al McFarlane bought them in Ballyclare Auction House. Matthew McLean bought the fake number plates. And minutes after those plates were purchased, they know from one of Matthew McLean's phones, made a phone call to Gavin Coyle. Now, why is that relevant? So there are everyone in this case is charged with the attempted murder of DCI Caldwell. Mm. Alan McFarland is also charged with providing a vehicle used in the attack. And another defendant, Jonathan McGinty, is charged additionally with providing a vehicle used in the attack. Only two people, Brian Karen and Gavin Coyle, are charged with membership of, of the IRA, of, or what we would call the new IRA. Um, and Gavin Coyle last month pleaded guilty to two charges in connection with the attempted murder of a Catholic police officer in County Tyrone in 2008. And he was actually on bail for that at the time when the attack would have been carried out on DCI Caldwell, he actually was due to be sentenced in September in relation to those offences and was looking at a fairly a considerable sentence in terms of that. So what has Gavin Coyle, who is a well-known and self-confessed member of the NRA, got to do with members of this loyalist slash Protestant mm. organised gang? Well, that's where the connection is. The police said that the court said, the police officer said that there is police documented connection between Mr. Coyle and Matthew McLean, which goes back some time. So Gavin Coyle, the the that other um, murder of the police officer, did he have a personal gripe there or was that sort of detailed as being a more political or has will that detail come out in the sentencing? Yeah, that was a Catholic officer and that was purely to do with the new IRA purposely targeting Catholic officers and they have done that as of other dissident groups in the past. Is it a deterrent, I suppose, yeah. for people in the nationalist community joining that force? In this case, the prosecution 
and the police were quite clear that there was two motives to this killing. One of them is, well, you know, if the new IRA get to kill a police officer, then so be it, because they've made no, no um, secret of the fact that that's what they intend to do. But the main motive that they're saying is that there was a personal grudge by both of these parties who were element to this co-conspiracy, to this joint enterprise, against DCI Caldwell. So this was personal. This was a grudge. Mm. This was a vendetta. That's what the prosecution case is. And we must say, obviously, even though it is a diplomat court, that the prosecution case is at a very early stage, that none of this has been chosen. I heard some of the evidence against some of them. You can see that there might be a stronger prosecution case against some than there is against others. But they are, as of now, all seven are charged in connection with the joint enterprise. So you mentioned earlier there um, a thing called the firm, and that's what John Caldwell was investigating or certainly crimes connected to them. Just explain what that is. It's really that conglomeration of organised criminals, paramilitaries, dissidents. And, you know, maybe that brings together that whole idea of the political and the personal grudge. Yeah, the, the firm, now, there's no connection between the McLeans. Well, there might have been criminal connection between the McLeans and the firm in the past. The McLeans are almost like a, a sort of family crew, if you like. Mm. There's so many of them that they don't really need outside influences. But the um, the firm are based in and around the sort of Lurgan RMI area. And they also then were a sort of a sort of ramshackle gang of, of criminals who come from the most bizarre ranges of, of people, you know, some of them from very, very loyalist backgrounds and loyalist communities, you know, have brothers or uncles or fathers who've been in prison for loyalist activity. Others are the, the sons and grandsons of senior former IRA members who have been murdered in the past and who have been or have been in prison in the past and they've come together for purely a criminal enterprise. Now, people might find that hard to get their heads around. That's that's not as hard to get your head around because that's very money-focused as this is. So this is, you know, two groups, one who claims to have the sort of the purest of pure political intentions that they are carrying on, you know, the baton, the Sinn Féin are sellouts, you know, that they have sold out um, the, the Irish Republican cause um, for, to, for power and political power. And yet they, you know, this group are carrying this on. And yet when you get down to the nitty gritty, the prosecution case in this is, that they were actually colluding with a bunch of criminals in order to kill a police officer, not for any political aim, but just because he'd annoyed them in the past by investigating them, investigating them. PSNF had some considerable success in that area in him in terms of um of these offences. And what I noticed this week, especially on social media, is a lot of people who I wonder are they 15 years of age sitting in their mother's bedroom in a Shigavar t-shirt, but who, who cannot get their head around this and, and they're claiming that the media are all working for MI5 and that mm. we're all in a big plot and that none of this happened and that this wasn't claimed by the new IRA because one of the claims of the new IRA, there was actually a, a sign put on a wall of a shop in the Craigan, which I personally wouldn't have put much, much weight in had it not been followed up by the fact that they then again claimed it in a an interview, a statement that was given to a newspaper. And then last night, when these people were remanded, the SURA, which is widely known as being the political wing of the new IRA, released a statement. That's in that statement was in the name of Stephen Murney, who they describe um in the statement as being a, a senior SURA member. And they say, I'll just I'll read it out because it's in front of in yeah. front of me. They say Stephen Murney, they're calling their, their national chairperson. They say that um Brian Carr and Gavin Coyle and Jonathan McGinty found themselves targeted by the Crown Forces earlier this week in a large-scale operation which saw several homes raided and ransacked. The Republicans were drag dragged to Musgrave Interrogation Centre where they faced several days of intense question before trumped-up charges were laid against them relating to an IRA operation that took place in February. Now, there it is in black and white from their own political wing. So for any, you know, we lads here going, you're making this up and you work for MI5 and the, the IRA didn't carry this out. This was done by loyalist paramilitaries or whatever. There it is in their own words, an IRA operation, which took place in February of this year. So um, maybe we could just probably put that part of it to bed. It doesn't answer what they were doing um, in terms of these allegations that they were colluding with these loyalist paramilitaries or indeed explain how the relationship between Matthew McLean, who is a member of a, a family well known to the police, for being involved in organised crime and Gavin Coyle are so closely linked. There's a sense that, um, you know, the PSNI are going to go after everyone they possibly can who may be in any way, shape or form linked to this as a message to others. It's like that notion of 
one hand or one finger on the trigger, but many hands on the gun, this joint enterprise that anybody in any way involved, be it making a phone call, putting a tracker on a car, they're all going to they're going to go for them. And they have to, of course, because um, this threat risk in Northern Ireland has increased to severe. Now, we spoke before you were sort of a little bit critical about how it could ever have been reduced in the first place. Yeah. Um, But it was only in March that it's been increased again to this severe level, which is just yeah. un- underneath critical, isn't it? Yeah. So it, the, the thing about reducing it, it did seem a bit premature because it was reduced, obviously, because we know we had that big MI5 operation, which took, you know, has 11 people charged a connection with that. Maybe then the, the intelligence report resembled, look, they're not really a threat. But meanwhile, this, which would have been known to police, this link between senior district Republicans and, and criminals in and around that old area, they clearly take their eye off that ball um, because you would assume, and, you know, we assume at this point in time that there must there would be no intelligence which indicated an attack like this was going to take place against DCI Caldwell, or you would hardly imagine the PSNI would allow one of their own to be be sacrificed in such a cruel way. So what what there, there's clearly an absence, there was an absence in intelligence here. You know, there's questions about that. Did they pull Dennis McFadden out too soon? Should they have left him where he was, given he was embedded so heavily in with this group? Um, was that premature? And, and he of course was the, he of course was the spy that had been infiltrating the grouping for yeah. almost what, 10 years? Yeah, I, yeah. I suppose like you, people people like to on social media like to tell me how to do my job without knowing anything else about anything about it. But what I People are saying, you know, Dennis McFadden was a member of the new IRA and he was working for MI5. That's that's not actually true. Dennis McFadden was an MI5 agent <laughs> who came to Northern Ireland as an MI5 agent. And he infiltrated a number of groups before he became a member of the new IRA. So he wasn't a new IRA member who was, you know, turned by MI5. He was an MI5 operative who infiltrated the new IRA. And, it's, and there's quite a difference in there. It's quite a distinct Big difference time. in there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he then has obviously disappeared off the face of the earth. We don't know where he is. Well, he before he went, he arranged a number of stings in, in buildings and in houses which were bugged and meetings took place of what were alleged the leadership of the new and, and a whole raft of people are charged in connection with that. Um, and now, you know, these charges against these people, you know, again, you know, they can say that they're holding charges. But the fact is, there's not going to be any bail conditions given in a case like this for quite some quite considerable time. Our justice system works ridiculously slow here. I wouldn't expect this to come to court any time in the next, you know, two years. Um, and then that, at that time, then people can be held on remand. And in some ways, that is part of the, the PSNI tactic. I do understand that some people have said, why was so much police resources put into this? We're told, told that 400,000 hours of CCTV has gone on numerous officers um, if you had someone who was murdered and that, that killer remained unsolved, you might say, well, why wasn't my loved one given all those resources? But in any country in the world, no matter where you go, leave aside Northern Ireland, you know, dubious police and history and everything else. If you attack a police mm. officer or a member of any kind of security forces, they will come for you and they will come for your numbers because they want to send a really strong signal, you know, that it won't be tolerated. So um, if anyone who's surprised that so much police resources were put into this, you know, just take a look at what goes on around the world. If there's attack on police officers of any kind, you know, that is when the full force of the law will come down, rain down on your house. Yeah, because it's attacking the very fundamental parts yeah. of society and the criminal justice system. That's so it. given these two and, you know, you, you've you've stated that they will take a while before these cases come to trial in Northern Ireland. There's obviously a backlog. It's a slow moving justice system. But these two different investigations, the McFadden one and then the John Caldwell um, cases that have just come before the courts and obviously that wider investigation is ongoing. Would this be seen as the final end to the new IRA? Would you see it as that this is the maybe that the Caldwell attempt on his life would have been the last thing of a dying wasp? Well, what happened was because of the whole McFadden thing and obviously the amount of publicity around that, and it made them look like a very amateur organisation who couldn't, who were infiltrated so heavily by MI5. And, you know, I, there were members of that group who were desperate to try and show, they kept putting statements out saying, you know, we will, 
keep the fight going and you know we will not give in we're unbound and unbroken and all this but I mean most people were going well they're, they're finished like they're done mm. um so they were keen to have what they would call a spectacular you know something that would show that they were back in business that they hadn't gone away that they were recruiting that they were you know regrouping and the call well attack was meant to be that but the fact that the call well attack now that it's been alleged by the prosecution was in fact you know um, a grudge against a man who's investigating very serious criminality, including, you know, robberies, drug dealing connected to a large organised crime group. That doesn't sound very political. Mm. Um, you know, you're not free in Ireland by, by you know, hooking yourself up with, you know, an ex-UVF prisoner to shoot a man uh, because he's been investigating criminality. So I'm not sure how that will play out with most of their base. They could, they, they could do the sort of, you know, the Trump fake news. We don't get fake news up here. They don't say we're fake news. They all say that we're working for MI5, <laughs> which, which someone actually painted on a wall about me okay. um, a couple of years ago. But they spelled my name, both my names wrong, both the Alison <laughs> and the Morris was spelled wrong. Um, but, you know, that is that is our version of fake news. It's, oh, you're getting that from the police, you're getting that from here, you're getting that. They're just, you know, that that's the, the way they try to describe the press up here. It's not something particularly annoys me, to be honest with you. But, um, yeah, so that, so that they can say that. But, the, you know, the facts are, um, are the evidence is going to be read out in court in future bail hearings and future cases and in this criminal case. And there'd be no getting away from that. I mean, you can't hide from that. Now, finally, are you expecting any further uh, suspects before the courts, do you think, with those other arrests that they've made? Are yeah. they still working away on files to the Director of Public Prosecutions or your... Yeah, there was 11 people who were arrested and then four were released pending um, further investigation. Then seven were charged and they were the seven who appeared in court on Bank Holiday Monday. But the, the other ones, there was a couple of names that were mentioned in court. Other people who seemed to be connected to that McLean um, side of the investigation um, so whether some of them end up facing more minor charges in the future, I'm not sure, but there does seem to be, and, and you know, for instance, there was an address that was briefly mentioned and it said that at the back of that house, there was two what they called burn sites where um, the inference is that clothing that was used by the gunman was then set on fire there. Um, and that's all part of the wider investigation. There's other investigations involved in the use of a different car, another car that was used during the what they call was the was alleged was the cleanup operation. So, you know, the inference is a lot of these people were involved in either providing cars that were used for the attack or then helping the gunmen escape the scene and then helping them clean up any evidence afterwards. So that could uh, well end up in more like minor sort of more minor charges being being um, waged against some of these people. Mm. It's clearly not over. And there's a hell of a lot more investigation still to be done before you would have a case that would even be fit for trial because the defence solicitors, interestingly, sorry, I never mentioned this, that one of the defence lawyers says that Jonathan McGinty was approached by MI5 while he was in Musgrave Police Station on the Sunday, the night before. I saw that. So bizarre. Court. Yeah, they, you know, I suppose, and the inference with there was he was said the case of my client is so weak that MI5 didn't try to turn him. You know, this is the what he was trying sort of saying. MI5 wanted him to turn against the rest of them because they don't have a strong case. Um, one of the other solicitors pointed out there was very little evidence against his client, apart from very low-grade forensic evidence, which then they can say can be obtained from other sources. Um, but some of them, the case against them seemed to be more um, fleshed out than others. You know, it seemed to be stronger than others. But we'll wait and see because, mm -hmm. you know, what's said, I have always found in the very early days and the bail hearings, the very early days of these big, long, lengthy, you know, um, terrorist charge cases and what then eventually appears in court sometimes could be very, very different. But, you know, the, the Brian Caron didn't apply for bail. Gavin Coyle did. Mm -hmm. I don't know why Gavin Coyle applied for bail, given that he was on bail when this happened. Um but Brian Karen solicitor said he would apply for for bail at a later date, that mm -hmm. they were just considering their options at this stage. And you would imagine that some of the other McLeans, and especially Ivor McLean, who's 72, and his solicitor said had a, a myriad of, of, of uh, medical conditions, will make further bail applications. And so we will get to get other details when that does come about. For sure. And bear in mind, I'm going to be keeping an eye on you to see if you're dripping in Chanel and uh, Prada handbags and <laughs> shades and stuff. And I'll know then whether or not you're working for MI5. <laughs> <laughs> you would like to think that given how many criminals I know and how many criminal trials I know that if I ever do turn to the dark side it'll be better at hiding it than that <laughs> you just can't you wouldn't be able to help yourself though in fairness double that's the way true. that's true <laughs> no I'm watching now just remember that okay. I'm watching okay you can you can make a podcast when I disappear like Dennis McFadden into the river and you go where's Alison exactly yeah. Yeah. to the Bahamas right yeah. <laughs>
Well, thank you very <laughs> much, Alison Morris. No bother. Okay, bye. Great.